Heavenly Father, we confess that our voices here are weak and frail and soft. But Lord, we look forward to that day with a glorified voice. When we will join together with all the redeemed across all the ages from every corner of the globe in that great eternal chorus, worthy is the lamb who was slain, who has redeemed a people for himself from every tribe and tongue and language and nation. Father, we look forward to that day. We stand this day in the hope of that day and we gather here to encourage and to build one another up as you have called us to do so in your church as we look forward to that day. Father, thank you that in that eternal day there will be no more tears. Every eye will be dry. Death itself will be no more. Sin will be gone. Father, thank you that in that great eternal day, we will be in your presence. There won't be a sun because your light will light the city. Father, thank you for the glorious hope to which you have called us. And Lord, as we look around our world today, we see so many without hope, so many in desperate and difficult situations. Lord, I lift up those still dealing with the aftermath of this Hurricane Helene. Lord, I lift up the cities that have been washed out. That entire region of the southern Appalachian Mountains that town after town is looking at months, if not years, of restoration. I lift up the families that are sitting there staring at everything being gone. Lord, would you bring hope, the hope of the gospel? Lord, would you bring physical help? For those that still need clean water and still need food and a place to sleep. God, I pray that you would work to bring rescue. And Lord, in the midst of it all, God, would your church shine brightly. For the hope that we have in Christ is not contingent upon the sun shining in the sky. The hope that we have in Christ is not contingent upon things being simple and easy and relaxed. The hope that we have in Christ supersedes and goes beyond all the trials of life. Lord, as we gather here in this place, as we turn our focus and attention to you, Holy Spirit, would you enliven your book? Would you speak louder than I can speak? That you would conform our hearts and our minds, our will and our passion to the image of Christ. Lord, that you would be glorified. Father, thank you for the glorious hope of the gospel. Thank you that the Lord Jesus who came and died and rose again for us is coming again. And of this we can stand assured. Be glorified now as we continue in worship through the preaching of your word. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, our children ages 5, 6, 7, and 8 are headed to Children's Church. They're going to have the privilege to Uh, hear the word taught on their level as we have the opportunity to open the scripture together. If you have a Bible, let me encourage you to open that up or turn that on as the case may be for you. 
to Luke chapter 11. We're going to be, Lord willing, in verse, keying in in verses 47 through 51. Uh, I'm in the middle of reading a biography on Diedrich Bonhoeffer. Some of you may know that name. Some of you are like, what, what did you say? It's, he was a German pastor, Christian, in, uh, in Germany in the 1920s, 30s, and into the 40s in World War II. His, his testimony is quite profound, and he was a brilliant man, brilliant scholar, brilliant pastor, loved the Lord deeply, loved the church passionately, and ha- had a phenomenal mind to think and to understand what was going on. His was one of the few voices that spoke out in the early 1930s when Nazi Germany began to spin out of control. The watching world didn't really know what was going on outside of Germany prior to about 1938-39. It it, it took a long time, many years. If you remember history, Adolf Hitler and his Nazi party were democratically elected by the German people twice twice in the late 1920s and early 1930s. And so Dietrich Bonhoeffer began to see what was this this rise, this passion to restore Germany, to bring back the German people. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer was like, some some of this is is, is idea. Yeah, we, we want to revive our economy. We want to bring back the joy of who we are as a people after being... Uh, just essentially wiped out after World War I, but he also recognized the dangers of the things they were talking about. He recognized the, the devious maneuvers they were making in order to breed an animosity between the people. And this ultimately, in 1933, bled over into the church. The church in, in that t- time in Germany was largely connected with the state. They were separate entities, but there was a deep connection between them. And there was this state-run push to assert certain things into the church that re- denied the gospel. They wanted to purify the German church by anybody who was not German not being allowed to be there. Initially, it was not being allowed to serve in leadership, and then it became not being able, allowed to be there at all. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer, when it was first introduced, was saying, that's not the gospel, guys. That's not the truth. And what he observed as one of the leaders in the church at that time, was those who were in positions of power were saying one thing with their mouths. You can read the speeches. Adolf Hitler himself said he did not want to do anything but support the church. All of the leaders down the line, they all openly said, we we want to support the church, but behind closed doors, they would malign the church. They would reject the gospel. They projected a a, a feigned honor, a pretend honor for the church, which undermined the very foundations of the Christian faith. We're back in Luke 11, as I mentioned. And to catch you up on the story, Jesus is still sitting around the table with in the home of this Pharisee, surrounded by other religious leaders. They had gotten into a little bit of a tentious conversation out, and out, out in the open in a public conversation. Most likely this dinner invitation came as a, hey, let's not have this conversation out in public because you're making us look bad. Let's go in closed doors and we'll sit down and we'll kind of gang up on you. And immediately Jesus goes into that dinner gathering and if you remember the story from a couple weeks ago, as we've been sitting around this table here in the story for a few weeks, he, Jesus eats with unwashed hands. And as the mothers cringe, we realize this is not about dirt and germs. This is about being ceremonially clean before God. And this Pharisee essentially becomes unglued. He sits there astonished, like, what, what are you thinking? What are you doing? And Jesus' response is a series of condemnations upon this Pharisee. A series of woes calling out this Pharisee's hypocrisy, saying you claim to worship God, but you don't. And as the story unfolds, Jesus lays out these woes upon the Pharisee, and then one of the lawyers who's sitting around the table speaks up and says, "Ah, you're kind of stepping on our toes too. We'll pick up reading the story in verse 5. If you have a copy of the word of, word of 
God in front of you. Luke chapter 11, verse 45 through 54. Hear the word of the Lord. One of the lawyers answered him, Teacher, in saying these things, you insult us also. And he, that's Jesus, said, Woe to you lawyers also. You load people with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets whom your fathers killed. So you are witnesses and consent to the deeds of your fathers, for they killed them and you build their tombs. Therefore also the wisdom of God said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and persecute. So that the blood of the prophets, all the prophets, shed from the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah who perished between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, it will be required of this generation. Woe to you, lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter yourselves, and you are hindering those who were entering As he went away from there, the scribes and the Pharisees began to press him hard and to provoke him to speak about many things, lying in wait to catch him in something he might say. This is the word of the Lord. The main point that I want you to see and to hear in the text here in Luke is that feigned honor obstructs true faith. Feigned honor obstructs true faith. Remember last week we took a moment to to kind of see this table setting that Jesus is surrounded by. Realize Pharisees and lawyers were similar but not the same. The Pharisees, that was like a political party. They're a political movement and, and lots of people were engaged in the pharisaical movement as they lived out their lives. They had their leaders, their upper echelon, but they, there were lots of people engaged in it. And this was largely the controlling power out away from Jerusalem in Israel in that day. The lawyers, on the other hand, that, that was an occupation. These were people trained and skilled in the law. Now, before you think they're sitting there in, in the courts and, and writing briefs and, and you know, shuffling papers all day, what's going on, these lawyers were experts in the Mosaic law. They were experts in what we call the Old Testament. If you take a Venn diagram, you know, a couple circles, and you say you've got Pharisees, you've got lawyers, there's an overlap where some lawyers were Pharisees as well, but there were groups where there were Pharisees who were not lawyers, and there were lawyers who were not Pharisees also. The lawyer who spoke up was concerned that Jesus' condemnation of the Pharisees was too broad. Jesus, you're, 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 you're condemning more than you realize you're, you're condemning, right? Again, look at verse 45. One of the lawyers answered him, Teacher, in saying these things, you insult us also. But here, when, when most of us would have the polite, refined, cultural manners to say, oh, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, did, I didn't mean to step on your toes, or, or put a disclaimer or a footnote in there, something that would lessen the blow to those that he was not specifically speaking to, Jesus just responds with greater condemnation. Verse 46, and he said, well, woe to you lawyers also. For you load people with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. As the passage unfolds, we see another series of three woes given to these lawyers. And it's all about hypocrisy and the obstruction to true faith. Last week, as we looked at verse 46, we saw that fake rules, legalism, obstruct true faith. This week, in verses Uh, 47 to 51, we're going to be seeing how feigned honor obstructs true faith. And Lord willing, next week, we'll finish the chapter and we'll look at false teachers obstruct true faith. While there are human players in the obstruction to true faith, we have to realize these come out of the devil's playbook. There is a spiritual war at place when we see these things. These are subtle, plausible ideas which look good on the surface but are far more dangerous to true faith than an out-and-out attack against it. 
Remember Satan's temptation to Eve in the garden? It wasn't a, hey, come and let's rebel against God. It was a, did God really say? You know, if you, if you do this, you'll actually be like God. It was a different tact. It was a different direction. It was different. It, it was a subtle deceit. As many of you know, I enjoy going fishing. A lot of times we fish with lures. We, we, we fish with, with fake bait. And, and there's, there's lots of pieces that come together in order to catch a fish with a lure. You've got to tie the right knot. You've got to know how to cast it in the right place. But, but here's the thing. There are some fish that will just say are dumb enough to bite anything. And it really doesn't matter how your lure looks. I've seen fish literally caught on a bare hook just dangling in front of them. But there are other fish that if the lure does not look and act and sometimes even smell, because there's a little stuff you can sm smear on it, your hands stink afterwards, uh, to, to make it smell right, if it doesn't play just right in the water, they won't take the bait. But if your lure is just right, if it plays the part and acts the part just right, the fish comes after it and doesn't know that it's fake until the hook's in his lip. Satan's most effective lures look and act a whole lot like the truth, which makes them deeply deceptive and dangerous. Last week when we saw how hypocrisy, fake rules, legalism tempts us to think that our standing before God is based upon our performance. These lawyers had devised elaborate systems and details and all these different measures to say, this is how much God likes you right now. How are you stacking up? These lawyers, they devise these elaborate systems and we're tempted to as well. We're tempted to measure how much God likes me by how many times have I been to church recently? Or did I, did, did I control my anger towards my neighbor this past week? And we think, well, I'm doing pretty good on those things. So God must be happy with me today. And, and when, I, when I lose my temper with my anger, I blow up at my family, or, or I, I perhaps miss church so many weeks in a row, uh, it, God, God doesn't really like me. I need to figure out how to get back into his good graces as though God has something other than his amazing grace. The gospel proclaims God loved you when you were still a sinner. <laughs> you didn't do anything to earn God's love. You don't do anything to keep God's love. He has set his love upon his people. His love is not measured by your loveliness. In this week, we see how the devil loves to obscure and obstruct true faith through feigned love honor the hypocrisy of feigned honor look back at verses 47 and 48 again speaking to the lawyer jesus says woe to you for you build the tombs of the prophets whom your fathers killed so you are witnesses and you consent to the deeds of your fathers for they killed them and you build their tombs it's feigned honor i, I the word feigned is probably not a popular term but i was trying to make it you know, three F's over the three weeks. So indulge me for a moment. The word feigned, it, it simply means pretended or simulated or, or faked. It's not true honor. It's a pretend honor. The, the verses continuing down to verse 51 become a little bit more complex and strange. But let, let's begin with these two. It, it, realize it's no hidden secret that the religious leaders in Israel in ancient times were not kind to the prophets of God by and large. If we, it doesn't take much to look at how the kings and the religious leaders treated the messengers of God throughout the Old Testament. For instance, Elijah laments before the Lord in 1 Kings chapter 19. He says this, he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the swords. And I, even I, only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. He's not fully aware that God has hidden away some of the prophets who have not been killed. But he recognizes there's been a lot of brothers who have been slaughtered. God rebukes the people through the prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 2. In vain I struck your children, they took no correction. You, your own sword devoured your prophets like a ra ra raving lion. 
Under Nehemiah, there, there's a public confession, how they recount their history and they confess before God their guilt. And we see this in Nehemiah chapter 9. Nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against you and cast your law behind their back and killed your prophets who had warned them in order to turn them back to you. And they committed great blasphemies. Even Jesus in Matthew chapter 23, when he stands there looking at Jerusalem, what does he say? Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. The city that kills the prophets and stones those who were sent to it. So these lawyers stood in a long line that was not necessarily good. They stood in a long line of religious leaders there in Israel who had a rough track record when it came to responding rightly to the messengers from God. These are the same ones who openly declare their love for Abraham and their love for Moses and their love for David. All the prophets, they displayed devotion by building and restoring the tombs of the prophets whom their forefathers had killed. They would go out and make elaborate decorations. And the monuments of old, these, these prophets would call for holidays and times of remembrance and dedication ceremonies. If anyone honors the prophets, it is us. See how much we care about these. For, for, for we make sure that their tombs are cleaned. We make sure that their headstones are decorated. We make sure flowers are regularly delivered. delivered. We, we put plaques inscribing what they have done. We've even got a little museum with a video that you can watch to see the story of their life with a gift shop so you can get a little memorabilia thing to take home with you at the end. But Jesus exposes their feigned honor by declaring... They're building the tombs is consenting to their murder. Their fathers murdered them. And they're building their tombs. One commentator said, your fathers killed them and you're making sure they stay dead. All their feigned honor is nothing more than a religious show deceiving themselves and all who see them about what true faith in God actually looks like and actually is. They looked the part. They played the part. And everyone who saw them presumed they were the part, but Jesus cuts through their hypocrisy and condemns them for it. It's the same thing Jesus would say in another setting surrounded by religious leaders where he looks at them in Mark chapter 7 and says, Well did the prophet Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites. As as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Jesus calls out another similar group in John chapter 8 even more explicitly where he says this, I speak of what I have seen with my father. And you do what you have heard from your father. And they answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me. A man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You are doing the works your father did. We skip down to verse 44. You are of your father, the devil. And your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning. He does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. You remember Shakespeare's classic play, Julius Caesar? Some of you are like, oh no. It's a fascinating play. It's a classic from Shakespeare. It's, it's up there right behind Romeo and Juliet, if you were keeping track. Right after Caesar is slain by some of his closest friends, Mark Antony, who's kind of the hero of the story, gets the opportunity to speak to the people of Rome. They're gathered in the square. Antony stands up with a famous speech. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar not to praise him. 
The evil men do lives after them. The good is oft interred with their bones. So let it be with Caesar. The noble Brutus hath told you Caesar was ambitious. If it were so, it was a grievous fault. And grievously hath Caesar answered it. Here under the leave of Brutus and the rest, for Brutus is an honorable man. So they all, all honorable men, Come I to speak in, funeral, in Caesar's funeral. He was my friend, faithful and just to me. But Brutus says he was ambitious. And Brutus is an honorable man. He hath brought many captives home to Rome, whose ransoms did the general coffers fill. Did this in Caesar seem ambitious? When the poor have cried, Caesar hath wept, ambition should be made of sterner stuff. Yet Brutus says he was ambitious. And Brutus is an honorable man. You all did see that the lupr- on the lupercal thrice I presented him a kingly crown, which he did refuse thrice. Was this ambition? Yet Brutus says he was ambitious. And sure, he is an honorable man. The speech goes on. I won't bore you longer. But the speech, as Anthony continues... He's unfolding, and you hear him recounting over and over and all. Brutus says he's, he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. We've got we to we take him at his word. He's an honorable man. And by the end of the speech, the people gathered around in Rome are screaming mad at those who killed Caesar. Why? Because Anthony's proclamation that Brutus is honorable was feigned honor. He was saying all the right words. He was acting in the right way, but everything he was doing undermined that honor. The lawyers knew the words to say. They knew the places to stand. But everything else in their lives denied true faith in God. Today, we don't have a huge push to decorate tombs. Not the tombs of the prophets. They didn't walk on our continent. But this idea of feigned honor is not far removed from us. We don't have this in in the dramatic display. Jesus is engaging. But whenever our outward confession of Christ and our declaration of honor to God, when those things are in contradiction, contradiction to our the pursuit of our lives we are guilty of feigned honor we see this dramatically in two separate and and i'm going to say these are kind of opposite sides but they actually are guilty of the same thing in our culture and there are others but these two i want to just highlight for you the first we see it in what we call liberal protestantism i don't say liberal in terms of political speaking i see liberal in terms of theologically speaking Okay, so what we see here, these are churches where they would clearly affirm believing in Jesus and worshiping Jesus, but their actual belief rejects the Bible and the clear teaching of Jesus. It's feigned honor. If you visit London in Westminster Abbey, they have on regular, uh, a regular occurrence of what's called Evensong. And it's a glorious worship service. You will hear almost 30 minutes of scripture being recited, being prayed, being sung. It's just straight scripture all the way through. It's led by the Anglican Church. In 2022, the Anglican Communion published a 60-page booklet in multiple languages spread throughout the world to openly argue that the Bible never establishes a gender binary of male and female, but only references biological sex, leaving the concept of gender wide open to anyone's personal interpretation. In so many ways, the Even Song is the amazing worship of God because it quotes the scripture for like 30 minutes straight in various forms. But yet the beliefs of those guiding it are far from biblically faithful. 
This is the case in so many mainline Protestant denomination churches in our, in our culture here in America. There's so many where lip service is given to the Bible and to Jesus, but the belief and practice rejects the faith once for all delivered to the saints. It's not to say that there are no faithful Christians in those churches and those groups. There are. There are faithful pastors who, who serve in those areas. But as a whole, the denominations and the groups have drifted. And, and this is why, just from casual observation, you see the Methodist Church in America has faced massive schism over the last two years where those who believe the Bible and stand on the Bible are, are pulling out of formerly united Methodist Church. Because of those who've rejected it. They want to obey the word. Not just say they do. The second group. Seemingly on the opposite side. Has fallen to this exact same deception. This obstruction to true faith. Is found in in what's commonly called cultural Christianity. This might hit closer to home for many of us. It's found what a friend of mine who now pastors in Alabama calls affectionately mullet theology. It's a vivid picture. Jesus in the front, party in the back. I'm glad there's not a visual illustration for you today because we wouldn't, you wouldn't hear anything else. These two groups are culturally about as far apart as you can get, but they are both guilty of feigned honor to Christ. Cultural Christianity, most visible in the Deep South, which is not South Florida. It stops at about the Tallahassee-Jacksonville level. It's most visible there. You hear it communicated to the through the poetry of cultural Christianity, which is largely country music. Country music, and I'm not slamming the genre, I'm just saying what you hear in some of these albums, there can be a song about faith in Christ and about the glories of heaven and longing to see Jesus. There can be a song like that in an album followed immediately by a song that glorifies drunken debauchery. The same album, the same artist. There's an album... By a very popular country artist. I'm not going to say his name because I don't want to mess everybody up. The, the, the opening song is glorifying alcohol and all the fun and trouble that alcohol brings into your life. The sins that drunkenness produces. And it ends with songs about eternity with Jesus. Cultural Christianity sees Getting up and going to church on Sunday morning about on the equivalence is going to get drunk in the bar on Saturday night. In cultural Christianity, you can get rudely cut off while driving, flash the bird, berated with a tirade of profanity from the other driver, all while driving to church. And when they pull in front of you, you see a Jesus fish on the back of their car. And you follow that Jesus fish and they pull into the same church parking lot where you go to church where they get out and greet you warmly and walk in to sing praises to God. Similar to liberal Protestantism, there is a massive disconnect between the statement of belief, giving lip service to Jesus and the Bible, even showing up in church over against the life that is lived, which embraces so many sins and vices, which the Bible clearly condemns. In both, we see feigned honor, obstructing true faith. They say, I believe in Jesus, but their lives reject that claim. True faith leads to life transformation. It doesn't mean you're perfect, but you no longer celebrate the sin and brokenness in your life against which the wrath of God is displayed. Rather, when you sin, it grieves your heart and you repent and run back to Jesus, who is your righteousness. Tragically, I believe that churches across our country are filled with those who feign honor to Christ, but in whom there is no saving faith. God is not merely after your Sunday schedule. He's not after your your dutiful verbal affirmation. 
but rather you are called to love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength, to love your neighbor as yourself. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 these words, Or you, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexual, homosexuality, nor thieves, nor greed, the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. Such were some of you. But you were washed. I love that. You were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Jesus saves sinners. He saves sinners not to leave them glorying in their sins, but to call them out of their sins to walk in holiness before him. True faith in the gospel brings about transformation in life that is an honest, authentic, open about, yeah, I'm a sinner, but I'm repenting and trusting in Jesus. I'm seeking to obey his word. I want us to also see the guilt of feigned honor. Look at verses 49 through 51. Therefore also the wisdom of God said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some whom they will kill and persecute, so that the blood of all the prophets shed from the foundation of the world may be charged to this generation. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the sanctuary, yes, I tell you, it will be required of this generation. In this section, Jesus lays into the lawyers, dropping an anvil of condemnation upon them. When Jesus quotes the wisdom of God, he's not citing directly an Old Testament passage. So you won't see a footnote that says, look in Isaiah. Uh, it, it's, it's not there. He's, what's going on here is this sounds a whole lot more like God himself, Jesus, speaking his parable of the wicked tenants. Jesus is citing himself as the wisdom of God. In Luke chapter 20, we get this parable about the wicked tenants. It, Jesus describes a man who plants a vineyard and, and builds a wall around it and sets a tower up in, it, in, in the midst of it, and he leases it out to tenants and then goes away to another land. He allows time to pass, and then he sends back one of his servants to gain some of the fruit of the harvest. And the tenants who are there are like, we're not giving you anything. So they send him away shamefully and empty-handed. So he sends another servant and another servant, and they beat him, and they and they, they abuse them and they send them away with nothing. Finally, the owner says, I'm going to send them my son. I'm going to send them my son. They won't refuse my son. And they send his son. And the tenants gather around and said, this is the heir. We kill him. We got it all. So they cast him out and they kill him outside of the vineyard. And then Jesus asks, a similar group that he's sitting around the table with here in the story in Luke chapter 11. What will the owner do? Jesus is the wisdom of God, speaking with authority over how the religious leaders throughout so much of the history of ancient Israel rejected God's messengers. He says in verse, one, verse 51, from Abel, recorded in Genesis chapter 4, if you remember the story, all the way to Zechariah, who is uh, recorded in 2 Chronicles 24. What you have is ranging from the very beginning of the first book to nearly the point that Jerusalem is burned to the ground. And Jesus asserts twice, the blood of all those slain would be charged to that generation. What does Jesus mean by that? Jesus, are, are you saying that somebody else, Cain's guilt is now attributed to the religious leaders in Israel at that time? I mean, that's, that's, that's a long time. What we must realize is that all the prophets who came before were ultimately pointing to Jesus. Their message ultimately was pointing to the Messiah to come. Jesus himself is the ultimate final prophet of God. God himself come in the flesh. 
And those who came before were faithful servants and messengers, but Jesus is the beloved son. In Jesus' words, he is foreshadowing his death and how the religious leaders would drive the call for his crucifixion. The wickedness of Cain down to the wickedness of those who rejected and abused and murdered all the prophets pales into in, to comparison to the rejection of the murder and the murder of the Son of God. Those who feigned honor by purporting to hold up Abraham and hold up Moses and hold up David and the prophets of old, they would be the ones who would stare at the Messiah in the flesh, God himself come to earth, and they would holler, crucify, crucify him. And in the early founding of the church in Jerusalem, more than once the apostles would stand up in Jerusalem and they would point at the crowd and they would point at the religious leaders and they would say, you killed the Lord of glory. You put him on a tree. The rebellion against God from across all the ages would reach its climax in the execution of God the Son. And all history records this greatest of all evils charged to their account. We must recognize today there is great guilt in the hypocrisy of feigned honor to God. But see the grace of God in this. God still sends his messengers. Did you see that? God knows they're going to be rejected. He knows that they're going to be abused and murdered. He even tells his prophets, you're going to suffer for this. And his prophets so often are like, I, I'm just, Jeremiah is like, I'm just going to quit talking. I'm not going to say anything more. But the word of God was like a fire in his bones and he could not keep it in. God still raises up and sends forth those who proclaim his word to call you to true and saving faith. Perhaps today you realize that your faith is little more than feigned honor to Christ. Jesus calls you to repent and run to Jesus. In the book of Isaiah... The second half of chapter 5 is a series of woes against the people. Very similar to what Jesus calls out here. Woes against the people through the, from God through the lips of the prophet Isaiah. And then in chapter 6, famously, Isaiah gets a glimpse of the throne room of God. He beholds the Lord of glory. He sit, sits there and he's, he is blown away. And what is Isaiah's response? He's just proclaimed the woe of God, the condemnation of God upon the people. He gets a glimpse of the glory of God in the throne room. And how does he respond? Isaiah chapter 6, verse 5. And I said, woe is me, for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Wait, this is the Holy One of God. This is the messenger of God. This is the prophet who just called down woe upon the people. But when he sees God, he says, woe is me. But the Lord comes in mercy again. Because it doesn't end with that. It doesn't end in verse 5. We look at verses 6 and 7. Then one of the seraphim flew to me having in his hand a burning coal which he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sins atoned for. When we see ourselves in the light of God's glory, we all recognize we have nothing left but woe is me. For we are people of unclean lips. We dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. Our sins are great in the face of Almighty God. Every person who's ever lived except for the Lord Jesus Christ is a guilty sinner before God, unable and unwilling to make ourselves right. And yet God in love sent His Son 
He sent his beloved son to take on flesh like ours, to live the life that we couldn't live. And yet he died the death that we deserve. He died for you in your place, taking the wrath of God against all your sins in six hours on the cross. Hollering out at the end, it is finished. Three days later, he rose triumphantly from the grave, conquering sin and death and the grave forever for everyone who will turn to him in faith. Jesus came and took on flesh, knowing that many in their feigned honor to God would be the ones hollering crucify. But in his death, God punished your sins and mine. And he purchased for you in his resurrection your eternal life. Turn from your sin. Turn from your hypocrisy. Turn from your feigned honor to God. And trust in Jesus today. Brothers and sisters, the Christian life is not about feigning honor to God. It's about repentance and faith from beginning to end. Yes, true saving faith brings about life transformation, but God's grace transforms your desires and passions from the inside working outward. When Christ opens your heart and you are saved, you look at how you once lived and you realize, ah, I I can't do that anymore. You you, You look at how what once was pleasurable and joyful and you look at life and you're, you're like, that, that's, that doesn't honor God. I need to repent. I need to change. And by his grace working in you, you are transformed from the inside out. And it is those who are saved, who are being transformed, who are called to go as messengers. Those knowing that many will reject and mock and even seek your harm. But we get to rest In God's promise that he will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And that means the church is advancing. A gate is a defensive weapon. So let us stand fast and march boldly, proclaiming the good news that Jesus saves sinners. You know, Jesus has never saved anyone who's not a sinner. (laughs) It's fun to think about. He saves sinners, even those who hypocritically feign honor to him. The feigned honor of the Nazis in Germany toward the church and toward God in the early 1930s led Bonhoeffer and many others who saw the gospel with clarity to ultimately reject what they called the Reich Church, the the church of the state, And become the confessing church. Those who held the true confession. Who held the gospel. Who preached the word. Who believed and lived the truth. And eventually that action. Would cost him his life. But their faith in Christ. Remained true. See feigned honor obstructs true faith. It's not just a first century reality. It happens all the time around us. In our culture today. Are you feigning honor to Christ this morning? Are you here just to play a part? See, feigned honor is not true saving faith. If that is you today, turn from your sin. Turn from your pretending. God is not fooled. Turn and run to Jesus. Christian, true saving faith doesn't mean you're perfect. It means your heart is grieved by sin. And you're repenting and running back to Jesus. Let us be a people known for deep and genuine and authentic faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the weight of your word that lands on us so profoundly. God, I pray that you would strip away any feigned honor to you. I pray that you would work in us, that we would be holy 
and genuinely yours. God, I pray that you would work in us by your Spirit to conform us more and more to the image of Christ. Lord, thank you that you are faithful, that you are good, and that Jesus died to save sinners. Work in this time as we respond to you. In Jesus' name, amen.